Hello everybody and welcome back to another exciting mystery reaction video. Now today I have picked something that I hope will be very entertaining if nothing else. It's called In Defense of Capitalism and it's something from the official channel of John Stossel. I hope I've pronounced that right, John. Apologies if I haven't. He has about 900, almost a million subscribers. So just a little sphere of influence in the YouTube universe there, John. And this particular video has about 200,000 views. You know, it was uploaded five years ago, but it's got a lot of likes and there's a lot of comments. You should go into the comment section when you get a chance. It's hilarious. But for now, let's see what John has to say in defense of ye old capitalism, because it really needs some defending. It's under attack and it's not fair. Is your life being wrecked by the super rich? The yeah. super rich, who are they? And what are, are they are doing they? to us? What it's are a they mystery. doing to us? It's a mystery. Whatever it is, people say that just the fact that the rich have so much is itself immoral. <sighs> immoral and wrong that the top one-tenth of one percent in this country own almost as much wealth. I love how they've gone straight to Bernie Sanders. It's just like, oh man, if someone's going to be the iconic image of someone attacking the evil capitalists, let's use Bernie Sanders. That'll rile our audience up. As the bottom 90 percent. Is that a moral outcome in and no, of itself? No, it's not. Um, it's not. And they want to condemn the people that actually have moved civilization forward. Your Ron Brook of the Ayn Rand Institute's annoyed that today's democratic socialists say rich people got rich by taking money from others. In fact, they actually improved the standard of living for every- They, okay. So this video, remember, was titled In Defense of Capitalism, not In Defense of Capitalists. And like the introduction here, the first 30 seconds has been framed in a very effective way in terms of its use as propaganda because that's what this is and that's how we need to think about this type of stuff when we're viewing it so what have they done here they've just started by saying oh you know we have all these rich people and everybody says they're immoral this is completely unjustifiable how could you even say that that goes against the american dream people who work hard and enjoy the fruits of their labor should be able to take it so then it becomes personal it becomes a question for you to decide in your head, hey, yeah, if I worked hard, would I want someone to call it immoral if I became rich off it? And so people have to sit themselves in little camps and decide whether or not they should be afraid of, you know, evil commies coming and taking away their riches. It's propaganda. And it's a very effective way of starting up this type of conversation. Hey, watch out. They're coming for you. And if they do it to the rich, you'll be next. Watch out. But let's see what they have to say. Let's see what this guy has to say. Look at him. Hey, Yaron Brook. Everybody on the planet. How is that possible? How could it improve everyone's living standards? How? Isn't there a Amazing. fixed amount of money in the world? So when rich people grab a lot, there's less for everyone else? No, because wealth can be created. We have basically this is a big kind of issue with the whole i don't know free market mythology but like what he's kind of saying there which is confusing people on purpose i believe is that you know oh the story is that you know rich take all the money and so there will be nothing left i think people are smart enough and there's enough common sense out there that they know that money is actually printed and like banks just created out of thin air so no there's not a fixed amount of money out there and so if the rich take a huge amount of it there won't be anything left because governments can just make more money now what is the problem with what he just did there was he compared money directly to wealth money does not equal wealth okay they are related to each other so money can be a measure of wealth but you can have wealth in many different ways you can have property you can um, own stocks you can own businesses you can have intellectual property like copyright and things like that they, they all contribute to wealth and yes that can be created we're all aware of that but like don't confuse people by saying they are the same thing Need about two dollars a day for a hundred thousand years in other words, we could eat what we what we farmed, and that was it. And then something amazing happened about 250 years ago. A few countries tried capitalism, 
For the first time, people were- For the first time. See, this is the narrative. This is the myth of the free market. It just popped up out of nowhere. One day, everybody woke up 250 years ago and were just like, you know what? Let's just do capitalism. Isn't that a great idea? Wow, I wish I'd thought of that. Why didn't we try this sooner? No, there were a lot of revolutionary events, wars and blood spilt over capitalism and whether that should take precedence over the feudal mode of production, etc, etc. It took a while for people to get to this. It didn't just happen like that. Something amazing happened just like that. It, it's like it's it's part of this, you know, free market mythology, which is built around the idea of choice. Everybody decided 250 years ago, they just chose it, they elected it, that they'd all partake in a capitalist mode of production. Well, oh. the profit from private property, that changed everything. Division of labor let people produce more with less, and then they traded to get even more. Wealth increased with every innovation. Cargo transported by ship used to be stored in barrels, in sacks, in wooden crates. Private property didn't come from nowhere either. They weren't just like, hey, let's just try this out. Like I said before, there were revolutionary wars fought over private property rights. People really died for that. And so like, it's not just an idea that comes out of nowhere. This is part of this capitalist fantasy that people just have good ideas and they get put into motion on a large societal wide scale. No, there's a lot of changes that happen like on the ground throughout society at all levels before something can just be put into practice. So private property, you know, it had to be fought for tooth and nail. The old aristocracy, the kings, the absolute powers of the world were not going to just allow people to have private property rights when they owned literally everything, including people. But it's the way they frame it is like, hey, this was an, this was a choice and wasn't it an amazing one? And here we are today. And that's why you live a life of luxury. So be thankful. Great. And offloaded by hand. Economist Don Boudreau points out that enormous wealth was even created by the invention of the shipping container. With it came a wave of specialized technology that dramatically increased the productivity of shipping. Workers today are superhuman compared to their brethren of yesteryear. We went from carrying <laughs> superhumans, right? The equivalent of two school buses with mere flicks of our wrists. Most of this innovation began just 250 years ago. 250 years ago, we suddenly discovered. And again, we're still on this kind of weird personal narrative thing. Like, you know, before that humans, like laboring humans, the majority of working people sucked. And now they're all superhumans because they can lift up, can, like they can lift up containers, like that go on cargo ships. Like what, what is this about? This is a weird story and narrative they're building here, but it's all based on people and ideas. It's got nothing to do with the actual mechanizations of a market or an economic system. So much for in defense of capitalism. So far, it's just in defense of people that do amazing things. That's the general storyline or theme that's running through here. Of the value of individual freedom. We suddenly discovered the value of leaving individuals free to think, to innovate, to produce without asking for permission, without getting the state to sign off on it. And we call that the Industrial Revolution. Industrialists, the people- No, we don't call that the Industrial Revolution. That is absolutely absurd. The idea that, oh, because people were like all of a sudden, hey, let's just do things without government control and, and engage in free markets. That was not the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was when technology reached a certain point which allowed industrial labor practices and industrial production to occur. It had nothing to do with people being free enough to engage in a market system. It's all about choice with these people. I guess they're libertarians. People who owned the factories employed hundreds, sometimes thousands of people, and they made enormous profits. And how does that benefit your fellow man? And ever since, politicians have complained about those profits. Yeah, it's the In Ayn Rand's state. novel, Atlas Shrugged, 
State officials demand that industrialists explain how they're getting rich helped others. I do not owe you an answer, but I could tell you in a hundred ways. Thousands of jobs, billions in revenue, fueling our economy despite your efforts. Hank Reardon was right. Capitalism created- Don't you love that voice? Yeah, it was all me. I wish I spoke like that. Probably had more subscribers by now, I guess. Created new wealth. We got much, much, much richer. And it's hard to imagine how much richer we got. The electricity, of running water, the things we all take for granted today, but we didn't have 150 years ago. And yes, some people complain about inequality, but everybody got richer. Even the- How did, how did capitalists or capitalism have anything to do with access to water and electricity? Like in most places, it, the state had to roll out this infrastructure, but, but might I add, under a lot of pressure from the working class. So like labor movements and stuff like that. They were like, we want access to clean drinking water. We want access to electricity. They had to fight for it. Capitalists didn't roll out power lines and put in sewer connections and run water mains so that people would have a better standard of living. Usually what the market does, it only provides that sort of stuff to people who can afford it. All right. And then what happens? Let's just say the state and working people fight hard enough and the state does provide them with access to these essential services. Then the capitalists come in and go, oh, well, people aren't getting as sick anymore because they've got clean drinking water and sewerage. So then we can make sure they're a better consumer for their entire life cycle and they've got access to electricity so we can make more electronic consumer goods. They benefit off these essential services that are provided to the people. And so this is part of these people getting richer. No, this was developments that usually happened because of this government control they were just complaining about like literally 10 seconds ago. The poor got richer. In the past several hundred years, we've gone from a society where people hope to get jobs that required long hours of hard manual labor to one where almost everyone has what they need to live and more people have leisure time to do things like watch movies. You know what? That is absolutely nonsense as well. People didn't just exist to hope to get jobs. The system is set up. The capitalist system. Look, I'm doing more defending of capitalism here than these guys are. Look, the system of capitalism is set up specifically. Okay, so that the means of production, so the productive property, factories, businesses, agricultural land, resources, all of those types of things are separated from the great majority of people. And so in a market system, if you can't create your own value, right? You can't create commodities that could be sold on the market because you don't own this means of production, then what do you do? You sell yourself. So there wasn't just great masses of people wandering around planet Earth waiting for some altruistic business person to take them under their wing and give them employment. This is another myth in this free market capitalist fantasy. And it's not hard to see this stuff if you know much about like modern history, but uh, it, it doesn't suit the narrative. You're a wizard, Harry. I mentioned Harry Potter because Brooke bought lots of Harry Potter books, but he says he's not poorer for it. J.K. Rollins became a billionaire and I got poorer by thousands of dollars. And yet nobody really thinks of themselves as poorer for having read Harry Potter. It made my kids happy. How much is that worth? So I am actually better off for having spent those many dollars on those books. Under capitalism, that applies to every transaction because capitalism, unlike socialism, is voluntary. Like a pretzel. We see this every time we buy something. The seller's there for his own. What does that even mean? That capitalism is voluntary? Like, what does that even mean? Like, I didn't volunteer to be a part of a capitalist system. The people that were instituting capitalism, they didn't bother to ask other people whether or not they wanted another style of economic system. So these the bourgeois, which are the people that set up capitalist systems across, you know, Europe, let's say, and, and North America, they took over feudal systems 
or old centralized systems under an absolute monarch, they took them for themselves and everybody else just lives with that. I don't think there was anything voluntary about existing in a capitalist system. And there's a lot of countries all around the world that were, you know, colonies of capitalist systems. They probably didn't want capitalism imposed upon them either, but they had to take it and advance because the world was advancing in a capitalist direction at the time. So I don't know what they mean by it being voluntary, apart from, you know, people potentially exchanging in a free market situation. But like if he's talking about capitalism, the idea, because socialism is not voluntary, it's imposed upon the people. Well, capitalism is imposed upon people too. I don't know what they mean by that. And so am I. So why do we both say thank, thank you? Thank you. Thank you. Because he wanted the dollar more than he wanted the pretzel. I wanted the pretzel more than the dollar. The transaction doesn't happen unless both of us think we win. And that way, voluntary transactions create wealth. Thank you. Thank you. Since the Industrial Revolution, we have more than doubled our life expectancy. We have dramatically increased the quality of our life and we are wealthier than anybody could have imagined. Made possible by private property and capitalism, which people hate. People don't like it because, you know, yeah, it takes capitalism. real responsibility over your own life to, to achieve something. And unfortunately, our educational system has Same. taught us that since we don't sacrifice enough, because we're, we're, we're basically too self-interested to sacrifice enough, the state must now intervene and force us to sacrifice for ourselves. This is what I talked about at the start. This is part of that narrative, that this is all about self-interest and it's people, amazing people that do amazing things. And if you work hard enough, then you will succeed. It's got nothing to do with capitalist relations and the endless drive to seek profit and all of that sort of stuff, which is inherent in the capitalist system. They've just reduced all of this to a personal matter that's all this is coming down to people hate capitalism because they are told that being self-interested is a bad thing but you know it's self-interest is what has made the economy so amazing it's got this has got nothing to do with defending capitalism it's just got to do with these ideas about how a free market should work and defending them to death without really considering i guess any other broader implications of living in a society where self-interest is the primary objective of society's standards. And that Shameful. belief that sacrificing for others is more moral is what gives socialism strength. It's not so tough to share your stuff. Every priest, every philosopher, every mother <laughs> has taught us that to be selfless is good. Selfless is good. No mother actually means that, right? She, no mother actually wants you to be last in line. They all want you to be first in line, but they tell you that because they think that's what nobility is. But the people who do for- And why do they think nobility is like that, right? Because I don't think people are inherently self-interested as you have described it. You've made it really, really black and white there. And I think humans are a little bit more complex than that. And using that thing, that analogy about mothers that want their child to be first in line, not last in line. I think that is a very poor and convenient narrative to paint a picture here that yes, everyone at heart is truly self-interested. No, when a mother wants their kid to be first in line, they probably do that because they don't want them to miss out on something, which is fine. It's not because they want them to be first so they're not last. They just don't want them to lose access to stuff. That's a weird and pretty stupid example to bring up there but like can you see though like to be to be able to explain this free market myth you have to use some pretty sketchy and like stupid like rather stupid examples to try and prove your points on stuff others really weird. are not more moral because they're wasting the one life that they have lots of us see morality as helping other people if your house burned down neighbors in america have always helped their neighbors what? Nice I thought you people. objectivists didn't approve of that. Ayn Rand was never against charity. What she said was that that was not the major virtue in life and that you should voluntarily have a choice about who you help 
and who you don't. The key is that somebody else's need is not a moral claim against your life. Your life is yours. Today, socialists say self-absorbed Americans won't help the poor and the sick. That's why government must force everyone to give. Otherwise, the weak and the poor will suffer and die. But indeed, the weak and the poor under capitalism have done better than in any other system. Is that See, this is, before I go on to explain how amazing capitalism is, um, this is part of the weird kind of um, way that the free market myth and capitalist myth has to justify itself by comparing itself to socialism because it is quite weak, the mythology around how the free market works. And so you have to explain that socialism is when the government does stuff and takes stuff away from you and robs Peter to pay Paul. That's not what socialism is about. Socialism is about the relations within the capitalist mode of production and a change to those relations, i.e. instead of owners, like so business owners and capitalists and the bourgeois owning all of the means of production, all of that private, that productive property we talked about before, instead of them owning and controlling it, it is owned by the workers. Now, yes, the state can get involved in that, but Socialism isn't about taking stuff from one person and giving it to another. Now, while that is a, you know, a classic kind of attack on socialism, what this little interlude here demonstrates is that they don't really have a hard ideology because they can't really explain what they're doing without attacking socialism. They can't explain themselves, their own economic structure that they love so much without comparing it to something else which they demonize. It just shows how weak this whole free market mythology is. Fantastic system that is fundamentally moral because it allows individuals to pursue their own happiness. Your pursuit of your own well-being, which is a virtue in and of itself, also helps the world be a better world. Okay, I really want to talk about that one because I think it is incredibly important. The pursuit of happiness, which is held up as this virtue of the free market and capitalism, is not what people think it is. The pursuit of happiness has nothing to do with gaining more material things or even things that you like, maybe they're not consumer goods, is not about finding things in your life that make you happy and pursuing those ventures that give your life meaning. The pursuit of happiness, which the founding fathers talked about when America was trying to gain its independence from the British, was about being politically active. The pursuit of happiness is having the autonomy over yourself as an individual living in a free and democratic society to engage in your society politically, meaning you can vote, you can make associations, you can go to town meetings and have a say, and your input can make a difference. Today, in our heavily consumer society, in our capitalist world, we have been taught that the pursuit of happiness is pursuit of happiness is chasing your own self-interest. But that's not what it was about. It was about equality in the sense that those people used to live under a tyrant. They were subjected to the whims of a king. And so when they sought their own freedom, they were then allowed to be politically free. They are allowed to have opinions and voice those opinions without someone locking them up or killing them. That is the pursuit of happiness. Now, let's talk about this video because I don't think they really talked about capitalism at all. They just talked about a bunch of historic events and ideas that people had and then really just shoved out a bunch of myths about the free market being, you know, people trade freely and people pursue things that they like to do and they're self-interested and that makes the world go round. That, all of that had nothing to do with actual capitalism, which is an economic mode 
it is a way of producing things and out of how you produce things that everybody needs to make a, a complex civilization work, how then all of the interactions, all of the social relations that people have sit on top of that base of how all the value is produced. That's what capitalism is about. It's got nothing to do with individual stories and individual pursuits of happiness. But like we didn't talk about any of the functional stuff. The closest we got to that was talking about like a container ship uh, that carries cargo as opposed to one that did it um, 250 years ago and people had to carry everything on hand. Now it's done by machines. And aren't we all lucky because laborers are now superhumans. This was just propaganda. That's all it was. It didn't go into the mechanics of the capitalist mode of production. It just talked about how wonderful all of the opportunities people have nowadays are thanks to the free market and how everyone's living standards have now increased and people aren't as poor as they used to be. So don't hate rich people. Don't hate them because actually you're better off than a peasant in medieval times. Well, you know what? I could have told you that. Okay, without trying to defend capitalism, I think most people would be able to put two and two together and say, yeah, okay, I've got running water and electricity and I've got much more food than other people might have had when they were living as peasants somewhere in medieval Europe. And they can make that that judgment on for themselves. They don't need that linked to how good capitalism is. So like, I don't know if they really even defended capitalism at all just then, but it's important to acknowledge that this was just a propaganda piece. And I think that is crucial for us as revolutionaries to be able to recognize propaganda for what it is and appreciate that this video is speaking to a particular audience, one that's probably not too keen on socialism. It's not too keen on really thinking critically about the problems of capitalism. It just wants to be told why capitalism is so good in terms of like, what are some interesting myths that we can take away and then use in conversations with our friends. So like, that's what propaganda is really about. So if we can use propaganda effectively to spread our own messages, that's the real takeaway we should have from a video like this is how to tell a good emotive story to make people be like, <laughs> yeah, God, I love capitalism. I mean, that's, I'm able to be self-interested and I have running water and electricity. So like, you know, we need to be effectively using propaganda just like our mate John Stossel here. So if you like that video, please give it a like, give it a comment and share it with someone who needs to hear it. Until next time, please remember, I am, you are, we are a mystery.